Doster. Rob Doster here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. Hell no. John Fink. Are we still live? Feel the 68 till I die. I'm sorry, man. I blacked out. Randolph children. DJ Khaled. You know the big DJ Khaled guy? And grow up and in. Goodman needs to be fired all the time. Josh Pastor. You're going to beat people straight up. You know the deal. Drink responsibly tonight. I'll be drinking with you. Darrell McNeil. From the bluest of the blue bloods to the smallest of the mid majors. This is Feel the 68. After that. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Thursday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. My name is Rob Doster. I have with me Wake Forts, Randolph Childress, and I have with me Marquette's Jarrell McNeil, and we have quite a slate of college basketball that we have to talk through. Uh, Michigan lost at Maryland despite having a 12-point lead at the half. We have Gonzaga down on the road by nine points at Saint, uh, Santa Clara. We have Illinois, who looks like they are hanging on right now at 65-64 to 64 with a minute 48 left as we speak over Michigan State. And Florida Atlantic came out of nowhere to survive. I'm not saying they won. They survived at Tulane by one point. We're going to get into all that. We're also going to make some picks on the biggest games of the college basketball weekend. It's going to be another outstanding Saturday slate in uh, in the sport that we all love, man. It's college basketball season, and we love it. It is here. I want to start with this, though, gentlemen. Michigan has now lost 10 of their last 13 games after starting out the season 3-0. and After winning at Madison Square Garden to beat Rick Pitino and St. John's, Jawan Howard has uh, run this thing into the ground. In the last four games, this is what I want to get to. Michigan has been outscored in the second half by an average of 12.3 points. They were outscored 43 to 24 in the second half tonight in a loss to Maryland. They were outscored 52 to 36 in a loss to Penn State. They were outscored 40 to 34 in a loss to Minnesota. And they were outscored 47 to 39 at home in a loss to McNeese State. What is going on here, RC? We've seen Juwan Howard sub out and have Phil Martelli step in and be the head coach for a game. We've seen Doug McDaniel now get suspended for all of the road games that they are going to be playing for the foreseeable future. What's happening here, man? What is going on with Michigan basketball? Those are two things uh, that I, I'd say I probably never heard or seen. And, you know, we were on the other night when when Juwan let Martelli coach. I thought that there might have been something wrong. Maybe there was a, you know, there was a setback in his recovery or something like that uh, was what my original thought was, is why I didn't say much about it or think much of it. Uh, the Dougie, little Dougie's, the road suspension, like that I don't get. That that I've never heard that before, where you can't travel on the road. I mean, and, and then you, but he gets, so he gets to play at home and not on the road. I, I don't get any of it. Uh, it, it's not for me to understand. I, that just doesn't make much sense to me. I've, I've never heard of any type of uh, academic restrictions that uh, I, if, if I'm them, I just want to get them over with. I would rather just go six straight and get it over with and you have them back than just having them at home. Or maybe that was just something he wanted to keep for the morale of the team. I, I don't understand it, but uh, I, I think they're just – trying to figure stuff out right now. I I, I can't, I, I don't have anything. I've never heard of it. So I've never seen it. There's nothing to pull this from. There's not, there's nothing to draw this upon. So what do we, I mean, what do you base this on? When have you ever seen any one of those two things happen in college basketball? Unless there was yeah. a reason for it. I don't know. Yeah. Jarrell, the biggest thing for me is that we've seen, uh, I think three straight games where Michigan has actually looked pretty good in the first half. They were up 33 to 21 on Maryland on the road in College Park, which is not the friendliest atmosphere uh, that you're going to find in the Big Ten, right? Uh, they're playing in the Palestra. They were up, I believe it was 37 to 27 on Penn State on the road in that building. And in both those games, they turned around in the second half and just completely. Uh, I'm trying to think of the way that I can say this uh, without um, having to the FCC get on us. Uh, let's just say that it was dribbling down their leg, right? It, it was not it was not pretty. It was not good basketball, and it was completely different than what we saw in the first half. How does that happen? Yeah, I'm not sure. And obviously, uh, just kind of like what RC said, uh, they got a lot just transpiring right now within the entire program. Uh, to be honest, and this uh, there's no getting around it that a lot of the stuff that's going on has to be a distraction for those guys. And then obviously with the uh, with the suspension to uh, to Doug, it just changes their team so much because he was such a pivotal playmaker and such a big part of everything that they did offensively. Uh, but even still, like you said, it's kind of been the same. 
you know, the same kind of happening uh, each and every game. They look like uh, a, a good team in the first half, and then the second half they come out, uh, you know, and they kind of just, you know, they 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 shooting the deuce in the bed a little bit. So it's uh it's a little bit concerning, but it's looking like the wheels are completely falling off right now. And uh, it was definitely a tale of two halves tonight against Maryland. Uh, they 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 made a couple more shots in the first half, and got out to a sizable lead. They were good defensively, and then. Uh, Maryland got it going, uh, and, and they started making the threes in the second half, and uh, they couldn't withstand the run. Yeah, you know what? Let me ask you this, Randolph. Um, when it comes to Jawan Howard, right? Knowing that there's a chance that you might have to be dealing with replacing um, your your football coach that just won a national championship, and knowing that he's dealt with all of the the heart issues that he has dealt with, and I don't think that we should minimize that, right? He is coming off of open heart surgery. How do you handle this if you're Ward Manual when when you're having some of these suspension issues and you're having, uh, you know, what what is very clearly a team that is not quite living up to expectations? Like, I, if you're Michigan's AD, what are you doing here? Well, one, I think he sees. I, I think we talked about this before too, Rob, as well. Um, this team struggles when the game gets tight because I don't think they got a closer. I don't think they got a guy that they can give the ball to when it when it matters to say, hey, let me run my offense through you and get you a bucket. As good as Olivier Comwa has been, he's been a role guy all his life, and then now we're asking him to be the man. And I always say to guys mm -hmm. all the time, there's a difference in being on the scouting report and then being schemed. So when you elevate to a point that you're the guy on a scouting report, then teams start scheming you. It's different. And he's in that position now where he's a focus of, of what teams are trying to do. And I don't think he's ever been that, you know, that guy. He needs help. And, and, and this team isn't as talented to do this. So I think when they, even we're going back to the Florida game that went into overtime, they had moments and opportunities. I think that's their biggest issue. They don't have that guy, that closer to help them win some of those close games, for one. So your question about the AD, um, one, I think that's a, a serious conversation when the season ends. You got to have with Juwan. Only Jawan knows that. I, I, I think he, mm -hmm. Jawan is not doing this because he needs money. He loves Michigan and he loves coaching basketball. So if he's healthy enough to do it, I think you you put that the you know put that kind of the, the rumors and everything to bed, and then you just get back to figuring out what we need to do to get uh, Michigan you know basketball back. Um, he, I think he's earned that right. So I, I'm not into any of the, that book, that BS. And I was getting ready to cuss and say it, but talking about should he be out of a job? Because I think that's ridiculous. I mean, if that's the case, then we got to fire every coach that's been at a school for four or five years that hadn't made the tournament. And he's been there twice. And he's one coach of the year. So uh, I, I do think there's some things you got to address, but he knows that. Uh, uh, with the team, they need to be better. But uh, I think the first thing and the foremost is, are you healthy enough? Can you do the job? If Juwan, if, if Juwan feels like he he is, then now it's how do we fix it? And then you do. Yeah, your I don't. I don't think you. Yeah, I don't think that you fire him here. I think you need to have a conversation about whether or not he feels he wants to keep doing this and he's healthy enough to do it. Because right. if it's something where right. he's he doesn't have both feet in, you're never going to be able to succeed uh, in this sport with both feet in. All right, there are 23 seconds left. Illinois is up 71-68 to 68 on Michigan State. When this game comes to an end, we are going to react to it. We're going to talk about it. But before we do all that, guys, Jarrell, I'm putting you on the spot with this one, man. I'm sorry to have to do this to you, but UCLA, <laughs> they, they damn near lost by 50 points tonight. The last time that I looked at the score, it was 84-37. to 37. Let me check on it right now. What do we got going? Uh, it went final. UCLA lost by 46. Utah put up 90 on them, 90 to 44. Like, if you're, what do you do in this situation if you're UCLA? You are UCLA, and you got a bunch of dudes out there that have very clearly given up on the season, one of whom happens to be the head coach. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's just like you said, Rob, it's, it's embarrassing. It's absolutely embarrassing to, uh, to have a team, uh, with the tradition, with the, the pride, with the, the hardware that UCLA has, uh, past to present, uh, they should never be getting beat by 50 points. At one point, they were down 50 points in this game. Uh, and I think it just speaks exactly what you said. I don't think – and this is no disrespect to Utah. Utah is a pretty good team. I've seen them earlier play 
early in the year play Houston really close. But, I mean, I don't think they're 50 points better than anybody in Division One. I'm just being honest. I don't think they're 50 points better than any team in Division One basketball. And, and, and that's road game, neutral site at home. I don't, it doesn't really matter. Like, that's the sign of a team where, you know, the guys are all out. They're all out, man. And uh, they're, they're obviously the effort obviously isn't there and uh, the cohesion isn't there. Uh, and, and, you know, we saw it the other night with, uh, you know, I know a lot of people had a lot to say about Cronin not showing up to the press conference and things like that. So, you know, all the signs are kind of there that, uh, you know, at some point when you're getting your ass kicked like this uh, and you come into the locker room blitzing guys that, you know, eventually those words start falling on deaf ears. And uh, that might be kind of the point that they're at right now in the UCLA locker room. I think that's exactly where they're at as uh, Illinois holds off the win, 71-68. to 68. Daddy Brad got it done. They beat Daddy Michigan Brad. State. I, I, do, <laughs> um, I, do wanna, I do have a couple things that I want to say about this. One, uh, the line here was Illinois laying three and a half. Luke Goody missed the front end of a one-on-one that would have helped them cover in this situation. Uh, good teams win, great teams cover. I think it's very evident now that Illinois quite is, clearly is a fringe tournament team in this spot. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peyton. Um, but, I, I mean, you lose your All-American, right? You lose Terrence Shannon. You lose a guy that we all thought was maybe the second best player in the sport, Randolph. And it, it hasn't really slowed them down. They went on the road and they lost by, I think it was five at Purdue. They had the thing down to a one possession game. It wasn't really all that close throughout the game, but they came back and they fought back and they were still right there. Uh, tonight, they beat up on a Michigan State team that uh, has not been at their best, is one and four in the league, but that's still Michigan State with Tyson Walker and A.J. Hogarth and Tom Izzo and, and Malik Hall. How was Illinois doing this? How, how were they found a way to continue to be able to compete at the level they're competing at? Listen, credit to those guys. I, 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 they still haven't done anything that you know. And I, and I said this, and I think people overreacted to it a little bit. I don't expect. I expect them to make the tournament. I don't think they're going to be as good as obviously we thought they were with Terrence Shannon. There. I, I mean, I think it was a clear cut. They would be number two. I thought we thought Purdue would kind of run away with it, and they would be the second best team in the league. I don't know if that's the case. Uh, they took care of business at home tonight. Uh, but again, it's against it's against a Michigan State team that I, I I'm just not as high as you guys are on Michigan State because I just think that the I've said it a million times I think the pressure of what they were supposed to be, the loss of hints of hints of Henson I mean uh, it's just it's too much to overcome, and it's why I said they're this year's version of Carolina last year. It's not an indictment of of uh, of of, of the, that group was saying that they're really bad player, whatever, however you want to crush them. It just happens that way at times. This team struggles to score. There's no consistency with that group. You take you take Tyson out of that lineup, and and, and what do you have? Walker's out, then I, I don't know where their scoring comes from. It, it, they're not even competitive, I think, if he's not playing well. He has so much pressure to play, to score 20 a game just to make them competitive. And, and, and I know they're going to fight hard for Tom Izzo, but after a while – Confidence is so fragile with that man, and and, he, and like I said, the people don't understand the way that the expectations of of having to live up to the fourth ranked team of the year beats your ass down. It beats you down, and and some mm -hmm. other teams. I think FAU struggled with that. Some they, they, they're struggling with the expectations of being a Final Four caliber team all year long, and that's just hard as hell to do, particularly when you're not you don't have a dude that's just better than everybody else on that team. You know, Michigan's better as a whole. They don't have one guy that can carry them, and 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 they're not that group. And I, I just feel like that's what they are. But, again, Illinois playing better than I thought they would, and I think the Purdue playing that way against those guys was big. But I, I, I worry about them as far as being a second-place team, but I think they'll hold on and be, you know, finishing the top five or six in the, in the Big Ten, and I still think they got, they're, they're, they're a tournament team. They just won't be as high seed like I thought they would before. Yeah, Jarrell, let me ask you this, because you you coached uh, Ty Rogers when it was, uh, I believe, we, on, on Meat Streets um, in, in EYBL yeah. and AAU. And I, I got to give him some credit, man, because uh, what Illinois dealt with specifically against Purdue and what I assume they're going to be dealing with quite a bit moving forward is um, Purdue put Zach Eady on him and just didn't guard him. I don't know what you guys called that. We called it dorking, as in dare the dork to shoot, right? And... Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, we got to get some insight on that one. Yeah, yeah, you got to go for it. Dare the dork to shoot, and that's kind of what they did. They dared. Well, I don't want to call Tyrod. You came up with that coach of your son, didn't you? You you told your son that coach of your son. You want to know know who that's from? You want to know who that's from? Timmy Miles. Does that surprise you that Timmy Miles would come up? Makes sense now, right? Yeah, I got you. I got you. I got you. All right, so. um, Ty Rogers, man, 15 points. I thought that was incredibly big for Illinois because when you are able to get that offensive threat out of a guy that the other team doesn't want to guard, it changes what you do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ty did a great job tonight, man. I was proud of him just to see him because I know he's probably tired of uh, us hearing, hearing us say that, if anything, because we've been beating it home in his head for the last three or four years now since we've had him as a player. But just, you know, he's such a he's such a gifted guy, but he's such an unselfish guy. And that's just the message is always just be aggressive. And he came out, he gave him a lift early on in that uh, in that first half because I think he started off the game five for five and had double figures, man. So he got him off to that good start. They rolled a little bit of a wave, was able to get a bit of a lead going into halftime. Uh, he struggled a little bit in the second half, but then made some more tough buckets down the stretch, man. But just him being aggressive, especially with Terrence Shannon out, as a different dimension of them. Uh, Domask wasn't great early, but, man, Ty had a big role in tonight's win, and hopefully we'll see more. But he just got to continue to stay patient. That's a big part of that. You can't force it when you got the big guy just sagging off in the lane. It makes you want to kind of just – press the issue but he did a good job of letting it go setting screens uh setting those flares on the back side is huge and he's a high iq guy so i think he did all the right things and uh you know they're gonna be okay going forward with that type of uh that type of system uh with, with guys guarding that way with the big tell rob get his bootleg internet fixed <laughs> he was big tonight, man. His first half though was was I thought he got off to a real big star for him. Yep. Yep. He it was it was huge and then We'll be right back. We gotta we gotta find out what happened to our guy Rob Dowster. Kill the sixty eight. What's going on, guys? Before we get back to the show, I need to let you all know about the Field of 68 Daily, an all-encompassing college basketball newsletter that arrives in your inbox, you guessed it, daily. For less than a dollar a week, you'll wake up every morning to more than 1,500 words detailing everything that you need to know to stay up to date on the world of college basketball. From the notable mid-major upsets to the stars that are out injured to the breakout performances that only our team of college basketball junkies watched the daily is edited and produced by mike miller who spent more than two decades running nbc's digital written content and is subscribed by more than half of the division one coaching staffs the biggest names in college basketball media and the agents that work as power brokers in the sport for just 50 dollars for the year you get access to the same information that the insiders get and before we get you back to your regularly scheduled field of 68 content let me tell you guys about the field of 68 merch store Head over to fieldof68.shop for officially branded Field of 68 apparel. Whether you're supporting your favorite team in the student section or from the couch, there is no better way to gear up than the latest from the Field of 68. The best thing I can say about our merch is the quality of the product. Anyone that has ever worn a t-shirt knows how frustrating it is when the neck gets all stretched out and the bottom of the shirt starts looking like the bottom of bell-bottom jeans. And there's nothing worse than a hoodie that loses its snugness that makes it such a perfect way to stay warm during the cold winter weather. Whether you're shopping for yourself or for the college basketball fan in your life, everything you need is at the field of 68.shop. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the field of 68. We, we lost our guy Rob again. We'll try to get him back. Listen, we're, we're not waiting on Rob anymore. Jarrell, you and I will take this thing over until Rob comes back. There he is. Yes, sir. Let's do it. Okay, he's moving he again. All right, so uh, I, I don't know what happened here, but I All have right. a – 
uh, an alert up on my screen of the TVs in my house right now. This is just a moment. You've caught us in the middle of a quick household update. We'll be finished in a few minutes. So that's always fun when uh, when Comcast decides to update your internet internet when you're in the middle of a live show. Um, I want to make one last point on Illinois before we uh, we move forward because I Jarrell, I said this to you um, when we were sitting here coming in. I said that there's a guy on this Illini team that I think gives them a very high ceiling that there are times where you watch him and you say he should be a top 10 pick. And they're all the wall when he plays. And that would be Coleman Hawkins. What do you make of him? How good can he be when he's good? And how much is he? Am I wrong in saying that he's not a liability? Because tonight he went from 15, seven, two assists, two steals, four blocks, three for five from three. No, you're you're spot on, and it's and it's it's just the the kid has been tr- trouble. I know he uh he said he's had some injuries here uh, over the last year or so and things like that. Uh, but he also said that he's you know kind of fully healthy now and getting back to himself. But uh, I think the thing that we all see when you see him is just that uh he oozes talent, man. The kid is super talented. He's gifted. He has size. He has length. Uh, I think he's an underrated defender. Uh, you see him in spots where he's constantly able to switch out on the pick and roll guards and uh, and stay down and not bite on fakes and use his length to make it tough for guys to score over him. He can stretch the floor. He can make shots from the outside. He can post up a little bit, and, and he can rebound. So, I mean, when he's playing well, he gave them, uh, uh, I feel like, with Terrence Shannon, a really high ceiling. Uh, but now the dynamic has changed a little bit now, and it's kind of like an all-hands-on-deck thing. So I think they need him to be really good, and, that, and more than anything, they just need him to be consistent uh, going forward here, man. But you got to give those guys credit, man. Underwood and their staff, they seem like they've had a great pulse for this team the entire way, and even the players and stuff talk about it, man. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just been impressive the way that they've been able to keep it kind of trucking here a little bit, losing such a big uh, and vital part of the team. Yeah, um, RC. It's the the whole booty ball mantra, the whole style of play that that Illinois has. I think it works for two reasons. One, Marcus Domask is so good at just kind of isolating you at about the mid post and and finding a way to go get a shot or or make a play. And you effectively have a point guard on the floor at the same time with Coleman Hawkins. Now, sometimes he likes to throw the ball into the third row, right? But more often than not, <laughs> he is able to facilitate the offense and make it run the way that you need it to run. Like I, I'm I I can't believe how good this team is after losing Shannon. I, I don't I don't think that they are uh win the Big Ten good. And I don't think when you don't have that superstar they are final four good. But I think they can still get to us. They just keep winning, man. They just keep doing it. You know what I the only thing and again, I, I, they are. They you, beating the middle of Illinois is gonna be a, is gonna be a tough task. It, that that that's gonna be a tough task. Like everyone, not just them what are you going to do on the road? Mm-hmm. And they got to, we got to see how this team, respond. and I think that's going to be the theme when we start talking about this, even when we go to our next segment is how, how will this team respond when they're on the road? And Hawkins can be, he can be that guy. It is like, like Jarrell said, it's a, it's a consistency thing with him. When you're 16, you can shoot like that. You got all this skill set. Can you bring it every night? Now there's a chance for him now. Now you, that you the alpha's gone. Now will you step up and prove something and do something that you hadn't been consistent doing? No one's question. No one ever questioned his talent. You just question whether he was going to be there and deliver it every game and every night. And so, um, this team is really good. All they're going to have to do is take care of business at home. Figure out some. That, that, that I think now losing Shannon, the expectations have changed. And mm-hmm. I, I, you know, again, I worry about them. And in in, you know, as we get deeper into the into the Big Ten, well, you know what? It's, like, it's kind of taking some pressure off them, right? Like now, these does, guys, it does, it does, yeah, it does. You just hoop. Yeah, now. now it's like now you just go yeah, and hoop. Like some of these guys I are playing play, with yep. so you, go there, you go out there and just hoop, you know. So, so shots. It's like I think things that Brad probably wouldn't have let them get away with before, you can get away with it now. Like you get to take some shots now that he probably would be like, man, come over here and sit down with me. Yeah. You, get, you get away with a little bit more, so yeah. it can help ease minutes ease crunching is bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you know, he got yeah. he got he got to play me fifteen a night now. You know, what I mean, yeah, he, he got have to, a choice. Man. Now I can't come out. <laughs> I don't have to up. look over my shoulder. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like yep. I take this shot before, and I'm looking over like, damn, he gonna take me yep. out. Nah, he can't take me out right now. I ain't he ain't got nobody <laughs> else to put in. So <laughs> it, it, that could be an advantage, but I do I, seriously. I think um, let's see how this team. Let's see how this travels because it's not just them. Everybody has these issues, 
uh, the difference was that he was that guy. Like so many teams just, you know, we talked about Michigan earlier. They don't have a guy, a closer. He was that guy. So we're not saying that they're they're good. They're not good without him. But they lost their closer. They lost that guy that, hey, you know what, well, I'm going to get this guy the ball. He a matchup nightmare. and ain't a damn thing you can do about it. He's going to get his shot off. That's what you miss. Yeah, and, it, and you miss changes that as you get in the college play. Yeah, and it gives you a little bit of, of a different dynamic, like the the transition game. Uh, there's no one in the country better when when they get ahead no. of steam and transition get than Terrence. Head, you, um, you mentioned the road. We got to talk about the road because in the last two days, we had number one, Purdue, lose at Nebraska. Number two, Houston, lose at Iowa State. Number three, Kansas, lose at UCF. Number five, Tennessee, lose at Mississippi State. Number nine, Oklahoma, lose at TCU. That is five of the top 10 teams in America and four of the top five teams in America go on the road, take a loss. Jarrell, what, what is this? Can we take away any for anything from this big picture in college basketball, or is this just, it's the road. It is what it is. The top teams in the country aren't uh, a, a complete level above some of the middle teams in their conferences and roads, a tough place to win. What, what do you make of this? Uh, I mean, I said this a couple of weeks ago. I mean, pretty much, and it's to a point now, I feel like nobody really knows anything. Uh, the teams that you think are pretty good or really good or have a good makeup or roster will go on the road and lose to a team that's had three straight bad losses, you know, if they get in the right environment. Mm-hmm. Or they'll play them really close. So, I mean, that's just the type of year it's been. Uh, a handful of teams, I feel like, the – the obvious teams have kind of showed themselves to be kind of uh, the cream of the crop uh, and, and head and shoulders above some of these other teams. Teams like Purdue, even with their current loss, like I don't worry about Purdue. I still think they're just the way their their makeup is in their roster. They're going to be one of the best teams, even uh, teams like UConn, obviously, uh, with clean game getting healthy. That'll be a big part of their journey as well, too. But this gives them a different vibe as well, too. But everybody else is just, you know, kind of meshed in together right now. And depending on what night you catch them and who's playing well, you really don't know exactly what's going to happen. And uh, I, I would hate to be somebody trying to do these rankings week in, week out. That's for sure. <laughs> I do the rankings week in and week out, and it's uh, it's not the easiest Ooh. thing to do. No, um, it's not easy, Rob. Rob, let me say this: what? I think it's, I, I think it's, we're halfway in, through the season right now. Everybody's played fifteen or sixteen games, right? You're literally at the halfway mark. Even though we, we're we're starting the everybody's three to four games into their conference, you know, their conference schedule, we're mm-hmm. we're at the midway point of the year. If you take away just the games this week purdue has had two true road games houston that was their second true road game kansas was their second true road game so everybody's adopted you know when they play in neutral site games and then they're playing in these in, in the early mtes so they're never playing on the road so so mm-hmm. people have adopted the same schedule and, and, and a lot of the blue bloods and people was doing it earlier in the in the uh you know, they've been doing it for years, but now all the top teams seems to be adopting that same deal where it's like they don't play road games until January. And then now you're just seeing kids and particularly your young players struggle when they're not home. And I think that's one of the more underrated things that you're just seeing happen. So I'm not overreacting to the losses, but you got if, if you're here in midway to the season and you're just playing your second and third road game. Like now we're gonna find out how good some of these teams are when as they get in the next month or so to see that because they you know some of these teams when they travel they travel so well it's like a home game. Yeah, and I also do think there's there's something to be said for some of the teams that are winning these games, right? Iowa State's yes. a tournament team. They went in there and it was kind of you it was strength on strength. You had two tough physical teams and Iowa State got out to a 14 point lead at the start of the game and there wasn't enough for Houston to come back. Uh, Nebraska, Kizzy Tomonaga, CJ Wilcher, like those dudes hit tough shots, you know? And Mississippi State got Tolu Smith back. He might be the best player in the SEC point blank period. And they beat a Tennessee team that has kind of struggled to be, uh, to have the identity that we've been looking for. It just, I don't know, Jarrell, it's just kind of, it is what it is, man. It's, it's, sometimes you got to give credit to the teams that win those games. 
Yeah, for sure. You have and, to win uh, those at home. Got, got, yeah, I'm about to say, you got to get those home games. Those are, those are marked on the calendar as uh, opportunities for a ton of these teams, especially when uh, when you get into that conference play season. So it's a different beast, and I think like RC was spot on. We'll see who's really good and who's not here in the next over the next month or two. And I just want you guys to know that uh, I'm, I'm being nice today because I haven't once mentioned the fact that last night Butler went into Milwaukee and took care of Jarrell's. Uh, <laughs> Listen, uh, we we got to get to a break I here. I promise I'm not going to freeze at this point. But when we get back, we're going to roll through the biggest games of the weekend. I'm going to put these guys on the spot. They got to make picks. Who's going to win? Who's going to cover? As you guys know by now, we've partnered with BetMGM this season. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68 each and every week of the college basketball season. We have a special offer that will be available starting on Tuesday, January 9th, and running through Monday, February 12th, the morning after Super Bowl 58. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, in honor of the big game, you can use the bonus code FIELD158 and you'll get $158 in free bets on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not you win that first bet. Here's how you make it work. Download the BetMGM app. Sign up using the bonus code FIELD158. Deposit at least $5 and place your first wager on any game. You'll receive $158 in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your bet. Just make sure that you use that bonus code FIELD158 when you sign up. And remember, BetMGM is now available under one wallet in select states. As a New Jersey resident, this is super convenient when I have to go cover games in New York or Philly, which happens quite a bit. When you cross state borders, you just log into your existing account and fire away. You don't have to create separate accounts in each state. It's easy, it's simple, it's clean. And most importantly, we have some fun stuff coming up for the heart of the college basketball season. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops, odd boosts, and my favorite, a nice juicy parlay boost. So download the BetMGM app and sign up today. Welcome back to the Thursday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark. Look, I told you I'd be back. I'm not frozen. We're here, and we are ready to break down what should be another great slate of college basketball. Rob Doster, Randolph Childress, Jarrell McNeil were presented by our partners over at BetMGM, and we are going to start uh, with a game down in the ACC. We got Syracuse. We got them traveling to Chapel Hill to play number 7 North Carolina. Uh, road games are tough. That is Saturday at noon on ESPN. North Carolina is right now on Ken Palm favored by 14 points. We don't have the lines over at bed MGM yet. We have the projections on Ken Palm. So that's, what we're going to use in their stead. The over under there is 150. Jarrell, who you got North Carolina or Syracuse? I'm going UNC. Uh, I'm buying all in on UNC right now. I kind of like the vibes they got going. They showed the ability early on to win multiple different ways. They got the firepower offensively. And it seems like they kind of finally got it right this year. All the pieces fit. And uh, Syracuse, uh, Judah Miss has been great this year, but they really haven't shown any ability to go in and win in hostile environments. So I'm rolling with the Tar Heels. I, I I'm going to um, – yeah. Go RC, we got to go in order, go man. We got to go in order. Yeah, I'm bad. I'm bad. <laughs> the first, the I'm one thing we told Randolph to do today was we got to go in the right order. Listen, I am, uh, I'm, I'm back in North Carolina here. I said it last night. I think they're a Final Four team. I love what they're doing defensively. I love what RJ Davis is doing. I love uh, the way that that team is kind of playing together, and I love that they could do things like go on the road to NC State and win one of the ugliest basketball games that you're ever going to see. They're winning games with defense, Randolph. North Carolina is winning games with their defense. Just went three and zero on the road, right? I mean, beat a pit mm -hmm. team that had beaten them three straight three straight times, and and I think five of eight or something like that. Then go beat Clemson at Clemson, and then and then uh, beat the rival and uh, one of their rivals in NC State on the road. You got to be in on them. I don't know how you pick against them right now. They are top five team in the country, and I, I think they're taking they're going from a good team to a great team. They're, they're trending in that direction. Yeah, I, uh, I tend to agree. Next up, Big Ten, Northwestern at number 15, Wisconsin, who has uh, kind of been under the radar in terms of the more impressive teams in college basketball this season. If you look at Ken Palm, 
Wisconsin is laying seven points. The total there is 136. Jarrell, are you riding with Boo Booey? What do we got? Uh, unfortunately, and this is really unfortunate for me being a Marquette guy, but I am taking uh, Wisconsin in this one. Uh, quiet is kept. I think, I think the Badgers – have an opportunity to compete for a Big Ten title. I think they're the second best team in the Big Ten. Uh, I, I've been somewhat impressed with the way they put it together after a couple uh, early uh, stumbles out of the out of the gates there in their non-conference uh, season. And uh, Northwestern is a good team too, so I think it'll be a tough, close game. But uh, I think eventually the Badgers get it done. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. Um... Boo Booey's awesome. I just don't see him going on the road to the Cole Center yes. and finding a way to, to beat a Wisconsin team that is currently sitting 4-0 all alone in first place uh, in the Big Ten. A.J. Storr has been the, the surprise for me. He's been the guy that's been a little bit of a difference maker here, and uh, I knew that he was a bucket getter. I saw him play enough at St. John's last season, but um, what he's been able to do, stepping into Wisconsin, averaging 15 points a game, um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he is their leading scorer this season. So uh, that's been one of the more underrated transfers. No one's really talking about him. He's been really damn good. Randolph, who you got? I, I'm going to follow suit with you guys. I, 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 you know, Boo Boo is capable of giving a Herculean performance. Uh, and I think that he's he's going to need it if they're going to go in and get that win. So I, I'm going with Wisconsin. I just think they're playing well. And then I think they're, in my opinion, the second best team in the, in the Big Ten. Yep. All right. Maybe we will have a disagreement on this next one because the GOAT, the greatest college basketball coach of my generation, I think the, maybe maybe the, there's an argument people will have with that, but uh, Rick Patino was taking St. John's, who is currently in first place in the Big Ten, tied with Seton Hall and UConn on the road to Creighton. Uh, Ken Palm has that at Creighton minus eight. Jarrell, taking the underdogs here? Taking the upset? I am not. I'm going... With the favorite once again, I'm going with uh, with Creighton. Uh, Creighton's going to be good, and that is uh, a very underrated and tough place to play out there, man. They uh, they sell that place out a ton. It's a hard environment to play in. It gets loud in there. Uh, the Blue Jays have been playing pretty good too. So uh, with uh, Cog Brenner and Shireman, uh, I think they'll get St. John's all they can handle uh, at home, and they'll pull that one out. Yeah, I'm going to go with Creighton as well because I think that they are the better team. But what I will say is this, uh, St. John's should be able to cover. If you're getting eight points with the team that likes to get out and press and get out and, and uh, like make that. it difficult for guards, and you have a team that does not have guys that are really great when it comes to breaking you down off the bounce, that's something you got to look out for. I like St. John's plus eight, but I think Creighton gets it done at home. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Blue Jays, but this matchup scares the hell out of me because that pressure of St. John, uh, uh, it, it's it's concerning um, because I, I worry about them speeding up the game with Creighton. Uh, but I'm going to go with Creighton at home. I think they'll have enough to get it done at home. And I'm like you, I would take the points if I was betting. All right, next up, Kansas at home, Oklahoma. A top 10 matchup of two teams that are coming off of a loss. The line there is Kansas minus four. And guys, this is where I need to tell you about Vaulted. Vaulted is an app that allows you to participate in daily cash prize pools without an injury fee. It is a place you can store your own predictions forever. And by using the Vaulted challenge feature, you can prove you're smarter than your friends. Go download the Vaulted app. That is V-L-T-E-D Vaulted to challenge your friends, store your predictions, and join daily cash prize pools without an injury fee. All right. Here's what I'm saying, guys. Kansas not only wins, but they do cover. The line right now, according to Ken Palm, is Kansas minus four. I am taking Kansas here. I think this is a bounce back spot. I think that they have a statement to make. I think they're coming back to the fog. And uh, I think Bill Self will have let them know about the TCU game, about the UCF game. And I don't think it's going to be pretty for uh, Oklahoma on the road here. Jarrell, what do you got? Who's your pick? I'm rolling with you on this one. I got the Jayhawks. Uh, it'll be tough to lose back-to-back -back games, especially going back and getting some home cooking. They could have quite easily had lost back-to-back -back games to TCU and uh, and uh, UCF, though. So uh, they haven't they haven't been great, but uh, they'll get a bounce back here and get some home cooking, and uh, I think they'll cover too. Yeah, buy low, buy low, man. The Jayhawks are struggling. That's Kansas in the fog. It's no, man, south. you got the money on the Hawks, man. You got to put the money on the Hawks, man. <laughs> you got to put it on there. Hawks, 
cover, man. Stop this. They're going to cover by four. I'm a big JV. I'm, I'm a McCullum fan, but I think Dewan Harris is going to be dialed in with him and try to keep him under control. Uh, I, I just think coming off a loss, put the money on the Jayhawks, man. So cut this out. Like, like we can go to the next team. Like they're, they're not losing back to back. <laughs> All right. Good. Yeah. You're just ending it right there. Moving on. San Diego State at New Mexico. Uh, another really intriguing game in the Mountain West, which is uh, it's a damn good league, man. I think it's like a five or six bid league this year. Um, Jarrell, San Diego State. They're only laying a point, according to Ken Palm. Think they can go into the pit and pick up a win on Saturday? I do. I'm rolling with San Diego State. And uh, I've seen them a couple times this year. And uh, I think they'll end up probably end up being in the uh, in the runners to win uh, the Mountain West again. So uh, it, it it'll be uh, that that'll be a tough environment to play in. The Lobos have got it going this year as well too. But I'm rolling with uh, I'm rolling with the Aztecs on this one. Yeah, I think that I'm gonna go with San Diego State as well. But as I'm sitting here and as I'm thinking about it and as I am looking at the standings right now. This is a rivalry game. This is a place where uh, New Mexico can put 15,000, 16,000 people in that building. They are loud. They are aggressive. They are angry. It's kind of like Creighton and Memphis and Wichita State in the sense that the team in town is the Lobos. Um, I'm regretting the decision that I made. I have to stick with San Diego State so Dagan doesn't yell at me, but uh, I'm regretting the, the decision that I made. In terms of football, <laughs> pick RC, Randolph, who you got? I'm going with the pit, baby. I'm not going against that. Like, listen, it's going to be like they're it. undefeated. At, they're undefeated at home. We just spent part of it tonight talking about how hard it is to win on the road. San Diego State's coming in seven straight wins. The the, the winning streak ends. They go down in the pit. Little little monster mash is going to have a great game. Get buckets. <laughs> New Mexico is going to take care of business at home. Yeah, yeah and look, you guys. Uh... <coughs> Fans need to start paying attention to Donovan Dent because Donovan Dent is a problem with a capital P. Uh, Kentucky, going on the road. We're talking about top 10 teams going on the road and having to deal with tough road environments. They are going to be playing at Texas A&M, who is currently sitting at 0-2. We thought they were going to win the SEC. Uh, Jarrell, Texas A&M is 9-6, 0-2 in the SEC, and they are now hosting Kentucky. Who you got? This is where I switch it up at a little bit and go left. I'm going with the Aggies. Uh, uh, Kentucky's inexperience catches up with them a little bit. The young guys kind of come back to earth. Another tough road game. Uh, and Texas A&M kind of puts the rest of the SEC on notice and says, okay, we may not have got off to the start that everybody expected us to this year, but they're still here. and They'll, uh, they'll have enough time to turn it around and pick up some big wins and still compete for, uh, for SEC championship. So I hear what you're saying, and I agree with what you're saying to a point. <laughs> Do you think – how many people on the Texas A&M campus right now know that that game is happening on Saturday? I'd say oh, God. Uh, 12 to 14% of the people know that that game is happening. So it's not going to be a real road environment. It's going to be a little bit sterile. Little I'm taking – Wildcats. I'm taking Kentucky. I'm taking Rob Dillingham. I'm taking Reed Shepard. I'm taking DJ Wagner. Those freshmen are going to get it done. They're going to keep proving you wrong, Jarrell. Keep proving doubt Wade wrong. Taylor. Keep proving the haters wrong. Randolph, what do you got? Rob, you know damn well they going to know Kentucky coming to town. I don't they, They're not living <laughs> under no rock. They, they showing up. If Aggies is coming out. Listen, they've dropped two in a row. They got to have it. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. They got to have it. And and I think they'll do whatever they have to do. I expect Wade Taylor to play well. Uh, Tyrese Reffer needs to, needs to step it up and get, you know, he's just coming back and he needs to get going. I like the Aggies at home to, to figure out a way. It's a big game for him. Uh, I, I think the crowd will turn up and show up and show out for him. Uh, I think they'll ride that momentum and get it done. And I expect a big a big performance. They got a closer down there, and I expect Wade Taylor to act like the preseason SEC player of the year. All right. This is a big one here. We got Virginia, who has uh, been struggling so far this season, right? They have not looked like the Virginia that we expected them to be. Uh, they are heading on the road to go play Wake Forest. We have a Wake Forest alum here on this show, who has been hyping up Virginia nonstop all season long. Wake Forest coming off of a loss uh, at Florida State. Jarrell, 
Are they going to turn it around? Is this uh, is this where RC stops crying himself to sleep at night? I think I think this is it. I think this is it, and I'm rolling with him. I'm going. I got. I'm going with Wake on this one. I do like their guards. Uh, one of the Chicago kids, Booby Miller. Man, those guys are going to play well. They'll get it done at home versus Virginia. Yeah, Boopy's going to find a way to get it done. I'm with Wake Forest. I love this Wake Forest team. I think with Efton Reed, um, they are uh, good enough to be able to to make a run. I think they're a second weekend upside team. We'll see if they can find a way to get into the tournament, but I would not want to face them when those guards get going. Or see, Randolph. Man, stop playing with me, Wake man. Win. I got my shirt on tonight. Y'all think I wasn't ready for this? Stop <laughs> playing with me. That's where we going. Ain't no question. The Virginia, the, the Hoagie, listen, the Wahoos are young anyway. They coming in there, man. It's going to be a smackdown, man. Go to the next team. We're going with the Deeks, baby. They pulling this thing. Out. <laughs> All right, we got, we got 30 seconds real quick. Jarrell, Arkansas, Florida, who you riding with? I am going with the Razorbacks. Razorbacks are going to get this one. They're going to get a big statement win on the road. Chomp, chomp. Gas chomp, up chomp. to the bus, bus. Gators get it done. Chomp, chomp. Randolph, break the tie. Gators, Gators man, at home. I love the backcourt. They're going to get it done. Yeah, Riley Kugel is a, uh, is a difference maker. Listen, um, we are going to have to talk about this Gonzaga game uh, when we come back from break. Are the Zags for real? Are they in trouble of missing the tournament? We'll let you know. Go Deeks. Now that the college football season is in the past and college basketball is in full swing, I need to tell you guys about our partners over at Rhythm. If you're into sports betting, you need Rhythm, the place for data-backed props and picks. For those that are unfamiliar, Rhythm, spelled R-I-T-H-M-M, is the go-to mobile app for player props and game picks. Backed by AI predictive models, Rhythm helps you make smarter and faster betting decisions across all sports, but particularly college hoops, where there are as many as 150 games a day during conference play, many of which have softer lines at BetMGM than you'll find in the NFL or in the NBA. With Rhythm, you get data-backed picks for every Division I game every day. Users get free picks daily with the ability to upgrade to unlimited access. And for those of you already using modeling, you can build custom sports betting models within the Rhythm app itself. I am a Rhythm user, and I found that I've been a better better when I focus on the lines where my gut and Rhythm's modeling are aligned. To kick off the partnership between the Field of 68 and the Rhythm, three people who download Rhythm at the link below and create an account between now and the end of the day on Thursday will be entered for a chance to win a free subscription with access to unlimited picks for college basketball, the NBA, the NFL, and more. So if you want to increase your edge and win more bets, go to the link in the description and download Rhythm today. That's R I T H. MM, the place for data backed props and picks. Welcome back to the Thursday evening edition of the Field of 68 After Dark, where Santa Clara just took advantage of a missed front end uh, to get a bucket with 4.7 seconds left. It was an and one. They're up by one. Uh, we're going to sit here. We're going to watch the end of this game and we will break it down afterwards. Before we do, we got to talk about Florida Atlantic. We got to talk about what is happening down there because they struggled once again and kind of got bailed out on the road. Um, Elijah Martin down by one. Uh, Florida Atlantic blew a late lead, and he gets fouled with 0.4 seconds left. I think it was probably pretty clearly a foul. If you guys disagree, please let me know. But he hits two out of three free throws. Florida Atlantic flies away to win 85 to 84. This is coming off of a loss uh, to Charlotte over the weekend on the road. They lost right before the new year on the road to Florida Gulf Coast. Uh, they are now sitting here at 12 and four. They are two and one in the American. And outside of that blowout, or blowout, that, that thrilling win over Arizona, it has not been all that impressive of a year for Florida Atlantic. Are you worried about them, Randolph? Uh, yes, I'm only worried because I now I, I look at their uh, – I sense from tonight's game, I saw frustration. And when I saw John L. Davis – if there's one thing I would say to John L. Davis, and I, you know I'm on record for saying how I love watching this team. It's one of my favorite teams, and I'm a big fan of Dusty, and he knows that. But if I was talking to John L. Davis tonight, I would say to him, 
I thought his complaining to the officials, he's too good for the amount of complaining that he was doing. And I thought mm -hmm. his complaining to the officials throughout the game nearly cost his team the game. Because he got he 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 to me his bitch his bitching and complaining hurt the you know there's a human element to these officials and you complain and complain and complain and was talking to them and showing them up and just running your mouth to them the whole time and I thought that nearly cost his team because I think that without a doubt the drive that he had before the last play was a foul and they didn't call it and I, I, I my suggestion with him is you're too good of a player just play the game man and let your game do the talking. Your team needs leadership because it looks like you guys are sleepwalking through the league right now. Like you're ready. Like you guys think you're going to hit a switch on a wall and just get back to that final four team. And it doesn't work like that. Um, you're mm -hmm. a damn good team. You're fun to watch. You're super connected. I just, so I wish you guys for you to, from a leadership standpoint, get your team together, fix, you know, fix your tone, your body language, your expectations and help your teammates get back to being the team that we all expect you to be. All right, so uh, the Gonzaga game just went final. Um, Adama Ball missed his free throw, but uh, Anton Watson looked like he might have rolled an ankle or hurt his knee there. He came up lame on the, the final possession and uh, ended up throwing the ball away. Santa Clara 77, Gonzaga 76. The Zags dropped to 11-5 and five on the season. They've now lost to Purdue. They've lost to Washington. They've lost to UConn. They've lost to San Diego State. Now they've lost to Santa Clara. And their best wins on the season, Jarrell, USC – Syracuse and UCLA. It's not exactly a murderer's row of a resume. And here's the biggest problem that they face. The best teams in the WCC, St. Mary's, they haven't been really all that good. And San Francisco is not going to move the needle with name recognition. I think I'm at the point now where if if they don't end up going 17-1 and one in the WCC, I think they have to win uh, that game against Kentucky on the road in Rupp on February 10th. Like, that might be a must win for them to get in the tournament, Jarrell. Is that am I am I going too far there? No, nah, I mean I don't think you are. I think it's based and it's basically uh basically based off of their schedule and they do this uh because of the conference that they play in. It's only so many shots that quality wins that they're gonna get regardless. Uh but they usually schedule a monstrous uh, non-conference schedule where they get themselves uh, a ton of opportunities to get quality wins as well, too. But uh, this has been a different year for the Zags, and they haven't exactly gotten those quality wins that they needed outside of their conference before they got to conference play. Uh, and even the ones that you think you thought were going to be quality wins don't look does don't look great anymore. Like UCLA is uh, far beyond a, a good win for anybody at this point. Now that's not going to help uh, teams going forward because uh, you know they, they're kind of they're kind of a dumpster fire right now. So uh, you know they're going to have to get they're going to have to put it, to put together a good streak here. Uh, I don't know if they'll need to go to seventeen and one, but I definitely think they'll need to beat the upper echelon, uh, uh, St. Mary's, and uh, obviously whoever else is going to be really good in that conference for them to make sure and ensure that they'll get in. Otherwise, the Kentucky thing, it, uh, it'll definitely be a must win, and it's going to be tough to get that one. Yeah, Randolph, it's very weird to look at this situation where Gonzaga is a team that doesn't have – any quad one wins at this point in the season, right? They're 0-4 against quad one. After this loss, they're 2-2 two two against quad two, like I mentioned. Those quad two wins. Syracuse, USC. Uh, the USC, uh, both those games ended up coming on a neutral floor. Um, if they do get in, this is not uh, – I, I mean, look, this is just not the same Gonzaga team that we are, are accustomed to seeing. Their reputation of being, of, of being preseason ranked is the reason they'll, they'll, they'll eventually get in. Because even with the loss tonight, they'll drop out of the top 25. So let's assume that they're going to win, the, you know, a high percentage of their games in conference, uh, be among the top. I think, I, I mean, if they're healthy, I think it's them and St. Mary's. Um, they have a game against Kentucky in February in, in, in you know, in Rupp Arena. And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody feels confident that they're going to go in Kentucky and win that game. So, um we're potentially looking at them going in with no quad one wins. And, and that's – I don't know what you say. I mean, I, it, it's, this isn't the same Gonzaga team as this before. They'll get in the tournament, but I think they're going to get into the tournament because of where they were being preseason ranked. And they'll win enough games in the yeah. conference to get back to the low 20s. But, but resume-wise yeah, – I, I say it all the time. 
Randolph, I say it all the time. At the end of the day, we can see it here. We could talk about the net. We could talk about Kempom. We could talk about quadras. We could talk about whatever we want to talk about. There are 10 people in a room making decisions. And yep. when it comes down to it, if you look at it and it's the same resume and one of those team names say Gonzaga on it and the other one says they get just San Francisco, who do you think is going to make it? They get them. Gonzaga. Yeah, so I think that's the biggest thing. Um, it is – you know, I, I don't want to give Goodman credit for this, but the thing that he always goes on and on about is he's worried about the long-term big picture stuff with Gonzaga, right? Because Tommy Lloyd. They got to get out. Because you lost the guy. Yeah. Because, well, because they lost the, the guy that brings in all of he that. He was getting the kids. He, he had the international. He, he was the connect to get the international kids in there, which was – what they were known for until they started getting the Suggs and the Chapman and those guys. When they got home grooming them, then it was like, oh, shit, now this national championship stuff here. And yeah. that's what they did. So will that happen again? Um, it doesn't look like it, but it's still a place he's uh, you know, it's a great coach. I just don't know what the dynamics changing to. And also, we got to add, too. How is hey, the hey, Randolph, I got, a, I got a question for you. RC, I got a question for you. Hold up that shirt real quick. Pop that, pop that shirt up. What you got on right there? Who is the leading scorer for that that team? The shirt, the shirt that you're holding up right there. Oh, it's Hunter Silas, man. They ain't want him. They ain't want to play him. He had to come over here. Yes, he had. To, <laughs> he came from Gonzaga, man. Forbes had to put that battery in his back. Now he playing like all American. Hey, that's how. That must be how talented they were a year ago, man. Now he comes to the Deeks, man, and he get that battery in his back, looking like all conference yep. guard. Uh, all right, guys, uh, let's do it. It's time. Toast of the night. Uh, we got about two minutes here. Remember, we're going to be going to last call. That's over on Stadium. It's over on the Stadium YouTube channel. We're going to be answering your questions in the chat for 30 minutes there. Jarrell, we'll go to you first, man. Toast of the night. Who you got? No, tonight's an easy one for me. Uh, Ty Rogers, University of Illinois. They got a big win. Like I said, one of my former players. Great to see him come out, have a really big first half, and be aggressive. Keep it up, kid. Randolph, RC. I was going to do the same, toast. but I'll switch up. I'll go to FAU, finding a way to win tonight. And John L. Davis, man, keep your mouth closed and ball out, man. Lead this team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just so you know, RC, on this show, he's officially now Nelly Davis. He's not Janelle anymore. He's Nelly Davis. Oh. That's what he goes by in the show. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's, he, he's, he rides with us now, so um, we are allowed hey, to call Nelly. him Nelly Davis. All right, Nelly, official. keep your mouth closed yeah. and ball out. <laughs> All right. Uh, I am going to go with a guy that uh, that transferred out of Arizona, a guy that had a potential when he was um, when he was playing in the Pac-12 that never really got the opportunity to show it and has this season that is a Dama ball. He had 17 points. He had six assists. He had three boards. He had three steals and he had the game winning bucket for Santa Clara. Uh, he's having a really good year. He's averaging 16 um, this season. And the one thing you could say about uh, about about the Bronx is that they find a way to be able to get guys to the league. So listen, this has been fun. This has been the field of 68 after dark. I'm sorry that all of my stuff froze. That's my bad. I blame Comcast. But listen, uh, we are going to head over to Stadium for last call. Join us there. We'll answer your questions right now.